Hey everyone, and welcome back to Cooking with Big Mark. Today, uh, panzanella salad. Yes, panzanella salad, it's a great summer treat, uh, mainly because of the unbelievable harvest of tomatoes everybody has and what, what to do with them. And it's a Tuscan uh, tradition to make this panzanella salad. Originally ended up, uh, started out with people who were trying to use a stale bread up and, one of, the, one of the ways they did it was this, and the the elision with the tomatoes out because tomatoes are, are so juicy. And we usually think a lot of recipes will say, you know, you know uh, seed your tomatoes before you use the, the, the flesh. And that's when you squeeze out the juice and the seeds. But this one, it's an asset because it, that is what soaks the bread. And a lot of uh, times, the old days, I used to take the stale bread and soak it in water and then squeeze it, squeeze out the water. But that, that to me doesn't leave a flavor. I think it's much better to, you know, use let the juice uh, of the tomato uh, do that. The name comes from uh, pane meaning bread and 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 zanella meaning bowl, soup bowl. And so it's a bread bowl. Is what the is what they're talking about. It's also uh, the basic one. Sort of uh, they say it's like the Italian flag. You get the red with the tomatoes, the white with the bread, and or the right could also be mozzarella, and the green would be sort of the basil, and that's sort of like the basic combination. But the, but the most basic recipes also have sliced red onion in, in it uh, as well. The olive oil, onion, you know, a little bit of vinegar if you want. You have basic vinaigrette. But taking that as a base, this bread routine can be done with all kinds of things, and a lot of people say it's uh, that the uh, it's not a uh, it's not a tomato salad with bread. It's a bread salad with vegetables. In other words, the bread becomes sort of you know the main thing. And all these different flavors you that you uh, you know induce it with uh, vinaigrettes or the things, but you can be expanded to all kinds of things. Not even leaving out the tomato, although I think to me tomatoes are very key because of the juice. But you can add you know any kind of any kind of herbs, any kind of meats, uh, you know, salami, prosciuttos, uh, chicken. And it makes it, you know, kind of a nice summer dish. And I think one of the best things, the basic uh, uh, panzanella, panzanella is to go with uh, all these people who do a lot of grilling in the summer, whether it's meats or chops or whatever else. This makes a great accompaniment because you get your bread and everything, and, you know, gives you a good solid thing. It's great with corn. And, uh, it's, uh, I'd say stale bread, but I think that there are a lot of good breads you can use too, especially with a lot of the artisan breads that, that we have now. And they say in some of those, you take them and you uh, toast them in the oven at 400 for probably eight or nine minutes until they crisp up a little bit, dry them out. And not too long, so you're not making croutons. It's not, and croutons, they're supposed to have a little give to them. And uh, then of course you take them out. Some people feel that even nowadays, that the taking a good artisan bread and toasting it is a better product than even using stale bread. So, but of course, if you have the stale bread, you absolutely want to use it. So those are the uh, that, that's the basic thing. And uh, then I have another application I was using. People on diets are trying to cut down you know, eating sandwiches. What I've done on a couple of occasions is uh, instead of having two slices of bread, I will take one slice and. and either toast a little bit or put it in, uh, in and just mix it in with whatever salad I'm making. It could be even tuna salad, chicken salad, green salad, and uh, anything that you would make a sandwich out of. And, uh, but it saves you a piece of bread, which is 150 calories. You can do it over a constant time, it could be sort of dieting. So that's another little you know, strange uh, application of it. And French breads can be used too. You got a really a good, a good ciabatta or a good focaccia bread that has a chewy you know, crumb to it. Those can be used with, even without toasting and still be very satisfactory. Italian ones as well. Italian, well, that's more, you gotta make sure what kind of Italian one, you know, not the, uh, even the uh, the baguette, the French baguette, some of them you know, have a nice chewy quality. Others are like, you know, the cheaper ones with a soft crust, uh, they're just, they'll turn to mush. You have to have a little structure in it. Well, yeah, it's not, it's not a real baguette. Right. So that's anyway, that's a, a great accompaniment uh, for summertime to go along with 
outdoor dining or anything else. And you use up all your kinds of vegetables, cucumbers, can go in anything, herbs and so on and so forth. So that's it, depends on our progress for the summer. Question, uh, we were down at Paula's on the Cape. You made a, a great panzanella, but also a really good uh, corn side dish. And I know it involved taking the, the kernels off the cob, but what else uh, did that comprise? Oh, I don't know. I, I make all kinds of corn salads, Mark. I just take it off the, uh, take the corn off the cob, obviously, and then I'll, I'll throw it in the microwave uh, with maybe a little butter for like four or five minutes just to cook it a little bit. Another way you can do it is if uh, outside, if you want to roast the corn on a grill and then uh, bring it in and cut it off that way, you, you, you get a little, you know, roasting flavor and smoky flavor into it. But corn salads can be mixed with anything. Again, uh, except the other thing we talked about with the panzanella, you can use corn the same way. Sure. All the, all the different combinations of herbs and tomatoes, just anything that is so fresh, zucchini, uh, cucumbers. And uh, what people are using a lot more now, as I've learned, and I've, we've talked about some of these talks before, is adding you know, apple cider vinegar, a touch of fish sauce or two other things. That, and using a little more of the Asian type dishes, like one of their, their basic things, so almost everything is uh, sugar, lime juice, and, uh, and salt, soy sauce. Those three things, the sweet, you know, sour, and the, uh, and the acid. And that becomes the basis, and that goes very well with corn as well, and scullions, but uh, it, the corn is just a cold. Then, you know, you get into, you can also scrape, once you cut it off the cob, if you're gonna make a corn stock, for a chowder or something, you just scrape it out the, the cord itself and get more of the milk out of it. Or throw it in with some water and make a corn stock. So well, that's interesting. I've never tried that. But uh, yeah, corn is a great, you know, it's a great thing for uh, all kinds of uses this time of year, especially. And especially for people who have, you know, teeth problems or you, know, that you can't eat the corn the way you used to. So it's always much more you know, more eaten easily off the cob, and just a little cream, some little fresh cream in the microwave. It doesn't need much to cook. You can almost do it raw, actually. So you're really just talking about in the most basic application, a little cream, a little butter, and salt and pepper. That's that's probably the simplest thing, yeah. Very cool. Well, I'm going to be uh, tasting something that would not go with either of the uh, dishes you suggested. It probably... Uh, would, however, be good with, uh, or I know, be good with grilled meats. And that's certainly something everyone's doing a lot of grilling this time of year if they have a grill, which we do not. So this is uh, Princess Gabi. This is a third wine from Chateau Gabi, which is owned by a member of our family uh, for the sake of ethics. Um, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about second and third wines versus second and third growths. Of course, your growths are going to be uh, the 1855 classification. Obviously, a lot has changed since 1855, and well, you know, the first growths continue at a high level of quality. Once you go beyond that, you know, some fourth growths are better than some second growths, yada yada, because it was classified a long time ago. But uh, what we're talking about are uh, second and third wines. And this would be uh, wines from you know, the same estate holdings of you know, whichever chateau you're talking about, uh, but they're kind of going through figuring out, uh, you know, certainly with uh, your, you know, your first wine, you know, the wine that's your flagship, ageability is a big factor. And so that's you know, you know, count into your selection of barrels and lots, but you know, the thing that's kind of nice about second and third wines is you're getting the winemaker's expertise. You're getting, you know, grapes grown on their land, you know, according to their uh, their quality, you know, quality level. So it it is often a good bargain and usually can be can be drunk a little bit younger. So some examples of second wines. Uh, one of my own favorites that used to be pretty inexpensive and is not anymore was Amiral de Bechevel, but you know, there's Alter. He, Alter Ego or Alter Ego, um, De Palmer, Pavillon Rouge de Margot, Pavillon de Leoville Porfore, and then uh, 
calling in the second wine, Le Petit is very popular. There's Le Petit Mouton, Le Petit Cheval, the uh, Le Petit Lyon of Chateau de Las Casses. And you know, those are all gonna be great quality. And one fun one uh, that's the Sauterne from Chateau de Mal is uh, their Fleur de Mal. And of course, uh, a reference to Baudelaire in which of course, Mal will be a, a shorter pronunciation. So Mal as opposed to Mal but still kind of a fun play on words. And I don't really think of the French as being into punning, but apparently some of them are. Um, talking about uh, growths versus third wines, example of third, uh, third growths from the uh, 1855 classification would be quality ones. Um, Calon Segur, Chateau Palmer, Chateau Malasco, Saint Exupéry. But we are actually talking about third wines within an estate as opposed to within the 1855 classification. Um, some examples would be Le Poyac de Chateau La Tour or Margot de Chateau Margot. And in this case, this is from Chateau Gabi. And their second wine would be Coupe Gabi, but this guy is the princess. And we are looking at 80% Merlot because we're in Canon Fransac, just above the Dordogne, so on the right bank where Merlot tends to dominate. And then 10% Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. I opened this about a half an hour ago. So we'll see, see how tightly knit it is. But again, this is, your third wines are gonna be uh, more robust in their youth and not need to sort of unravel over time. So really pretty nose, you're getting some stewed fruit. You're getting some sort of typical red currant, sort of very ripe red currant. This would be amazing with any kind of meat with a char, like the steak you were talking about. And on the, on the actual palate, you're getting a lot of very concentrated red fruit, fairly uh, agreeable tannins. It is a 2015, so it's had some time to kind of come into its own. Um, so yeah, really uh, rich cassis, cedar, um, really would be outstanding with any anything that has a good char on it. Uh, so this is Princess Gabi, uh, 2015, 80% uh, Merlot, 10% Cabernet Sauvignon, and 10% Cabernet Franc. We've been watching a lot of antiques roadshows, so I feel like I'm starting to pick up their cadence when they're describing uh, the appraised pieces. 80% uh, Merlot, made by... <laughs> It's a fun show. We haven't watched it in years. Anyway, that's quite off topic. Uh, thank you, Dad, for the uh, summer salad inspirations, and we will look forward to seeing you all soon.